which we um, bequest, that which we leave behind, um, uh, as we said last week, inheritance is what you leave someone, a legacy is what you leave in somebody. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to again look at that because we have a short window of opportunity, don't we, <clears throat> to um, change that. Bless the, bless the Lord, we can alter that and, and um, change that. But, you know, ultimately, it is not just what we say, is it? It's what we do and how we live. Uh, Spurgeon said this, A man's life is always more forcible than his speech when men take stock of him by reckoning his deeds as pounds and his words as pence. If his life and his doctrine disagree, the mass of onlookers accept the practice and reject his preaching. Bless the Lord. Um, it's true that um, uh, the Henry Stanley, remember he looked for Livingstone? And uh, when he found Livingstone, he lived with him. He lived with him. And um, Stanley was there really to, because they'd sent him as the paper, and he wasn't there uh, as a Christian. He was there as a, really an atheist, someone to just see what was going on and maybe report back probably negatively, as they did even then. Um, but he said, after four months, I saw his life. I saw his piety. His gentleness, his zeal, and his earnesty, his earnestness. It's not just his earnesty, uh, his earnestness. He said, I was captivated by this Savior he served. And he said, in that time, he never spoke to me about the Lord. Now, there's times that most of us be need to begin to speak, don't we? Because we have not said enough sometimes. But let me just say, there's some of us who need to stop speaking. Let me tell you now, some of us need to stop speaking and begin to live because our lives mean a lot more than our speech. And so sometimes, just be salt and light. Be. They are there. Bring in saltiness. Bring in light, even without actually saying something. A man said, I want to paint, in those, back in those days, I want to paint like Raphael. Say, who's he? Ninja Turtle, some of us, isn't he? No, he's one of the great painters of old. And uh, they said, well, this is what you need to do. You need to be near him. Study his method. Catch his spirit. Listen to his instruction. And have one thing and one thing alone. And one ambition alone. To be like him. To be like him. You see, and that is um, our ambition. To be like him. To live like him. To be with him. And then those who are living with us. To see that. To catch that. Bless the Lord. You see, we to say catching it in. Catch something from the Lord. Bless the Lord. They were um, cleaning off the graffiti in uh, Washington. Back in the, in the 90s, I think. And uh, the Washington Monument had been there for many years. And they were cleaning, cleaning it off, and uh, they found some graffiti from the 1800s. Woo! Um, but not graffiti like we, they, they leave today. Um, they were taking off the, um, uh, the marble wainscoting. What about that? It's a good one for you, isn't it? I had to look that one up myself. That's when they put uh, the marble on top of the, uh, on top, generally on the bottom, uh, to cover the bottom. So they took that off, and they found this. Um, written many years ago. This is what it said. Whoever is the human instrument under God in the conversion of one soul erects a monument to his own memory more lofty and enduring than this, this monument, reads the inscription that now can be seen by visitors. They left it there from 1800, written by BFB. They don't know who he is. Don't know what he, but what a great. Whoever Lead someone to the Lord has left a monument far more enduring. Why? Because we forget that our lives have an eternal purpose, have an eternal consequence. That, that's, that's a great, a great encouragement, but a great responsibility, isn't it? Because your life can either be a, a life that leads someone to eternity or turn someone off. 
That is an awesome responsibility, isn't it? Talked to many people over the years. I remember talking to a young man. Didn't want to know about the Lord. Didn't want to know about the Lord. And uh, digging a little bit deeper, his mum was a Christian. Um, well, she said she was. The dad wasn't a Christian. His dad wasn't a Christian. But um, he left. She left the dad and remarried. And he said, "How can that be anything to do with Jesus? How can that be anything to do?" And I had no words to say to him. What could I say to him? I, I saw all I could do is again point him to Jesus. Um, point him to Jesus. That sometimes we say we are maybe not what we say we are, and certainly not what we should be. Um, but we should be. Paul had the the ability to say, "Follow me." As I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. And that is our uppermost in our mind today. What are we leaving behind? What are we? And that's why uh, Moses said, Now remember, he was giving him a charge. Remember, he spoke the charge, but he didn't just leave that. He made Joshua, he was Joshua was living alongside him. And he was showing Joshua, this is how to live. These are not just words, Joshua. This is how to live. And Joshua could take that on. And of course, that's in, in Deuteronomy, the second reading of the law. He's telling them, now don't forget, don't forget, as you walk along, this is natural, be natural with the Lord. Sometimes we're a bit freaky, and we? We're a bit odd when we talk about the Lord. We just told him early on about some of those uh, men and women that have gone ahead of us now, when we talk about Edgar and, and um, Bryn and, and people like that. Just had a, a, a certainly Edgar had a, just a natural way of just speaking to people about the Lord. Give us that ability. To shine for him. And when people say, what is the reason, David, that is different? And we can point them to Jesus. Um, sometimes we are, it can be really odd when we're talking about the Lord. And it should be the most natural thing. He said, when you're walking along, it's natural. Why? Because the God of heaven and earth is not just our, God, our creator. He's our redeemer. And that's all those festivals and feasts in the Old Testament would, would remind us to the Jews. And that's why the, we love kids. God loves kids. He, God, God puts kids in our way, doesn't he? Because they love to ask questions. Why, is, why are we doing this? Dad? Why are we doing What's this about? And of course, when, when, when they were young, we used to make it up, didn't we? They thought Dad, they thought dad knew everything. <clears throat> Until they grew up and they thought that Dad knew nothing. Um, but they asked, and, and then, because he knew, and he said, the, your children will ask you why you're doing this. The children will ask you, why are you talking about this? The children will ask you about the law. The children will ask you about God's word. And you will just naturally say, this is what the Lord did. This is who we serve. A natural thing. In our households, we talked about it last week. Especially us men. God will take us accountable, won't he? Praying with our family. Praying with our spouse. Uh, our spouse may not be saved. Well, you pray out. I can say lay hands on her when she's sleeping. Careful now. Um, you may be tempted to do that. Uh, but pray for them. Pray for them. Say grace. Pick up your word. Let them see you reading God's word. Let, you, let them see you living out God's word. See, that's the key, isn't it? Let them see. Now, tell them, absolutely. But if, you're not, if they're not seeing it, then I would ask you and plead with you, say nothing. Say nothing. Live it out. Live it out. This is a continual thing. And uh, it doesn't stop. And that's why we, if you, uh, you last, not last week, the, the week before, um, our Tim preached on that, that, and I preached on it a few weeks before, and I encourage you to listen to those finishing well. Um, I run the race. Kept, I've, I finished. Kept the faith. Starting well, but finishing well. It's a continual progress. Um, Billy Graham was talking one day and encouraging people, and he said there were two brothers, one, uh, one Scottish brothers, Named John and David. John set his mind on making money and becoming wealthy. And he did. He did. But his other brother um, set his heart to serve the Lord. In the Encyclopedia Britannica, John is just simply listed as David Livingstone's brother. <laughs> David Livingston surrendered his heart to Christ. This is one of the things he said. I will place no value on anything I possess unless it is in relationship to the kingdom of God. 
Wow. I will place value on nothing, anything I possess in this relation. You know, on his 59th birthday, he only lived till he was 60. So one year before he died, this is what he wrote. My Jesus, my King, my life, my all. I again dedicate my whole self to thee. Tonight we're going to talk about living in a, a life of repentance. You see, repentance is not a one-off thing. Sometimes we think that, and, and that's why a lot of people, as we've discussed tonight, a lot of people make a decision for Christ but never actually come into, re, into real salvation or never progress because it's, it's an ongoing thing. It's relationship. So it ne- it's not stagnant or one-off thing. And right at this, this dying day, Livingstone could say, I dedicate my whole self to you, because it was an ongoing thing. So however old you are today, God says, look, come on, dedicate your heart afresh to me. Give your heart afresh to me. Bless the Lord. And it's amazing what is left behind. Amazing what is left behind. See, reputation, well, people have many reputations, really. what they're supposed to be. What maybe others have said about them, although be careful there, because remember we said about that before, haven't we? Uh, don't, don't ignore that totally, but legacy is what we really are, what we leave behind, what is built over a lifetime, not in a moment, and what our children and grandchildren will be for the rest of their lives. A man in 1900 thought he would look at the, um, the family tree of two people. He, he, he came across two people. He thought, I wonder if this really works. And uh, he, he saw a man called Jonathan Edwards, great man of God in the 1700s, and a man born about the same time, a man called Max Dukes, who was uh, an ardent atheist, a professing atheist, and um, uh, was not unashamed of saying so. And he looked at their descendants and, 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 and just traced their descendants through to see um, what, what, what would happen what that seed of faith, that which was real, was passed down. Remember, it's the uh, unfeigned faith, isn't it? The sincere faith. What did he say to Timothy? Timothy, this sincere faith, it's interesting he dropped that word in. Because it, faith it can be faith in anything, of course, but it can be, uh, un, it can be hip, hypocritical faith. Sincere faith that was in, in Lois and Eunice And now I know and can see and I pray and I hope is in you. There's that legacy and seed of faith, isn't it? Um, As someone said, like a flower of the field, leave seed behind. Leave seed behind. So Max Jukes, they found about a thousand descendants of Max, the atheist. 300, they said, died prematurely. Over 100 were sent to prison. Um... 140 sold them souls into um, vice, as in prostitution or robbery and that kind of thing. Uh, nearly three or four hundred, well, they weren't sure about this, but say 300 were, had given themselves all to drunkenness. And ultimately, he totted it up, and by the time 1900 had come, the family had cost New York State over one million dollars. Then you look at Jonathan Edwards, believer, married a believer. They found about nearly a thousand descendants of him as well. And they found that 300 were preachers, over 100 were clergy, 65 were college professors, 13 were university presidents. They had three U.S. congressmen, one vice president, 30 judges, 100 lawyers, and they said probably... Not one lawbreaker among them. Why? Because one man and woman set their stall out to know the Lord, to live for him, and to live with a sincere faith. And that has to have an effect and trickle down. And you say, well, I've got nothing before me, Dave, as we said last week. Well, now is time to start. You start the legacy of faith. If the Lord tarries, but now permeating through godly character, godly character with conviction, with zeal, with dedication and diligence. Bless the Lord. See, God does not 
give us preferences or suggestions. They're not suggestions, they're commandments, aren't they? And we've forgotten that. They took a poll of 600 pastors. Only 51% believed in a biblical worldview and absolutes. Truth, when we call absolutes, that God says 50% of pastors. We're in trouble. We're in trouble. That might be in America, I think, but we would say America's better than us on that sort of uh, level. So we're in trouble. Uh, but the Bible says a good man leaves a heritage for his children's children. Heritage for his children's children. Psalm 112. Psalm 112 says this. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. His children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Prosperity will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness and light dawns for the upright. Hallelujah. For the great, gracious and compassionate and righteous man. Bless the Lord legacy of those who know the Lord. Thankfully, we have uh, scripture, we have people down through history that left us that. And we have people in the, in the word of God that left a negative legacy that started well. And we looked at the kings and uh, I think our Tim said 30%, only 30% finished well. Started well, but didn't finish well, one of those that sometimes I read and think, oh, the potential, oh, the potential, um, was so, what great potential he had. Started real well, didn't he? Started in humility, started with a great character. Remember they said when he became king, there was always naysayers, of course, and um, they were saying, oh, who's he? Who's no good? And, and, um, we, and the Bible says Saul kept silent. Remember that? It's good to keep silent sometimes, isn't it? I'm not like that. Oh, Lord. Keep silent. Remember Jeremiah. Remember Jeremiah, and he was there, and, and, the, and the prophets were saying this, and the prophets were saying that. And what did he say? Well, I pray that's right, he said, didn't he? I pray that's right. And then he came back with the word of the Lord. But not at that moment. At that moment. Just be silent. And then uh, when they had that great victory, uh, they said, of course, the other people said, right, let's get those naysayers and let's square them up now. Didn't they? Hey, well, when Psalm 11, I think. We're going to square them up. And we are like that, are we? Right, let's, uh, let's show them how wrong they were. Uh, and, and Saul said, no, 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 no. There will be no one in Israel dying today. What a great character, humble, uh, soft before a soft heart, a forgiving heart. Bless the Lord. Oh, help us uh, be those people. But then the cracks began to show. Then um, we know the story, uh, the first story when he said seven days, wait seven days, wait seven days. That's the word of the Lord. Wait, wait, wait. Be patient. That's not what we like. He was impatient, of course. Um, impulsive. Oh, that's some of us. Some of us need a rocket to get going, some of us. But some of us are a bit impulsive. Some of us are impulsive. We, we you, and we there, and we there. And God says, no, no, let's get some consistency here now. Consistency. Boof. Straight. Up that level path. He likes a level path, the Lord. He leads us in a level path that broadens out. So he's impulsive, and he becomes, here's the problem, independent. And of course, that when, when he comes, and he, he can't wait seven days, and isn't it amazing how ironic it is, as soon as he offers, Samuel turns up. Just that little split second, isn't it? Between obedience and disobedience. Listening to God, faith, it, a small increment sometimes, holding on when we think, Oh, this is this. I'm going to try. I'm going to do something myself. And every time we short circuit God's work and God's ways, we always end up in trouble. Abraham, we have trouble today. The consequences of his sin are plaguing us 
today. Oh, yeah, look, this is never going to happen. Like, are we, we getting on? We just, no, let's, let's help give God a helping hand. Hoo-hoo. Ishmael turns up, and uh, we have a, a, a class of people in the Ishmael, the Arab people now, and dear me, Arabs and Israelis. We've had trouble for century after century after century. Why? Because someone thought they'd give God a helping hand. He doesn't need your help. He'll ask for it. He'll use you, but sometimes you just need to sit there and wait for him. Sit in his presence, not passively, actively, waiting and looking and just being there for him. And of course, we have that. And then we have cracks showing them, the cracks and the excuses. There we are. That'll show us where we are when we're challenged. We don't like being challenged. Oh, I don't. Jackie challenges me, and I'm like, oh, I'm good. At, I'm pretty good at excuses. Good at good excuses. I got a few things around the house to do, but uh, I am going to drill. Where's your dad's drill? I'm not sure where your dad's drill. And I did actually see it yesterday, you know, dad's house. So <coughs> I thought we'd have thought someone had uh, borrowed it. So I, that excuse is gone now. But excuses, and what did he do? He denied. He defended. And then ultimately, he deflected someone else's fault, didn't he? Someone else's fault. The people's fault, uh, the Philistines' fault, they were coming. The people were going, they were going to run. And ultimately, he blamed Samuel then, didn't he? Glory. He blamed Samuel, and he even blamed the Lord. He brought the Lord in onto the problem. And there was his problem. And he didn't listen. He didn't listen, and he didn't learn from the challenge of Samuel and from God's word. Because God's word, again, God's word was there before him. Remember Samuel said about the king, the king is to write the word of God down. He's to learn. He's the man who needs to know God's word more than anyone else. He needs to write it down. And because when you write something down, it's going through the eye gate and the ear. You learn it much more clearly and and readily. That's why when you revise, someone's not going to revise anymore. No one's only want to revise now. Um, When we revise, we make notes, don't we? Why we used to. That's, those days are gone. Oh, I do have to do bits and bobs these days. Um, so we, he, he, and he would have known Genesis 3, Adam and Eve. Classic. When they were challenged, what did they do? Denied, defended, deflect. It was that woman you give me. It was her fault. And the woman blamed the serpent and goodness. And, and that's the pattern. It hasn't changed. When you're challenged, you either deny it, it wasn't me, or this, defend it, it was because of this or because of that, or deflect, I was there, there, it wasn't me actually, it wasn't my fault, it was their fault. And there were the cracks showed, he didn't listen, deception rose up in his heart. And when it came to dealing with Amalek, Amalek is a type of the flesh, of me, I. And when Samuel said, you make sure you go and wipe them out. Don't keep anything. See, that's why Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. See, the flesh is the most powerful thing, our or powerful weapon we have. Satan comes and he goes. The world, well, to a certain extent, we can get out of it, to a certain extent, but flesh is always with us. The flesh is there, whispering and prompting and luring this way and deceiving us that way and we've got to be absolutely ruthless with it ruthless with it and ourselves and he said you wipe it out because we know we know that um, Amalek it's very interesting that um, right in Deuteronomy 28 Moses again he should have known this he should have known this because he knew God's word, he'd written God's word down, and he said, you remember Amalek? Make sure you destroy them. Make sure you destroy them. Remember Amalek? they the ones that um, picked the people off who, who, who drift, who were stragglers. they the one who came and destroyed the weak and the weary. That which was unattended, the flesh attacks. When you're weary and tired and you're, you're drifting, be very careful. Do not drift. That's why to be with the people of God, to be in the presence of God is the most important thing. Because when you drift, the flesh attacks. When you leave something un- unattended, un- out, of the, out of uncovered from the Lord, that's why the, the, the Bible says don't give the devil a foothold. 
For if it's not under the covering of the Lord, what happened? The Bible said in Ziklag, uh, David was off fighting, and everything was left behind in Ziklag. All his family, all his business, all his possessions, out, no one, no one protecting, no one covering it. When they came back, what happened? The Amalekites had taken the jolly lot. Let me just say, leave nothing unattended, out from under the covering of the Lord. Your family, your business, your wealth. That's why, see, when we, we should never compartmentalize our lives. We're good at that. This, is to, this today is, is church day. Well, it is church day, but every day is church day because God wants everything to be under him. Whatever you find your hand to do, do it as unto the Lord. Everything covered. And we see the flesh, Amalek, picking off those who are drifting, those who are weak, those who are weary, and uh, he said, now make sure you destroy Amalek. Make sure. It's interesting, the first battle um, of the Bible is against two. Amalek. Who was fighting Amalek? Joshua. Bless the Lord. So we're gonna, we, if, we, if, if Jesus is fighting for us, we're going to win. But how are we going to win? The only one because Moses was up on the mountain with his hands in complete surrender to the Lord. When his hands were getting tired and they were dropping, oh, the battle was losing. And so we have Aaron and, and, uh, uh, and who? No, Aaron, and who's the other one? Kept his hands up? There we are. You can look at that one up now, can't you? And holding his hands up. Why? Because, see, in surrendering, there's victory. Absolute victory. The flesh cannot win when we surrender. Submit yourself to the Lord, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit yourself to the Lord in the flesh. And so, what happened? Very interesting here that Saul kept the, the best and kept the leader, didn't he? As really, um, as a trophy, I think, and uh, there was pride there because the Bible also says he built, a, built a, a monument to himself. Built a monument to himself. And he never dealt with that real depth. You see, he started well, but pride is very is lurking, isn't it? When he became king, he, tr he took trophies, he took the best of things to show his prowess. Oh, look, I've taken the king. Oh, look at me. I've taken the best things. And when challenged again, he did not repent as he should have. He denied, defended, deflected. And then that was it. He left a sad, sad legacy behind of a man who was prophesied over to destroy the Philistines, but died at the hand of the Philistines. See, prophecy is only as good as the person, isn't it? Like personal prophecy, as good as the person who, who will carry it out. Has carried it out. And so we have uh, uh, that. But we thankfully, thankfully, we have also men and women who've left a great legacy. Abraham, the Bible says, um, trusted God. James said, he's talking about faith and deeds, and, and actually, it doesn't matter how much you say you believe in God, if, if, you, if your work and your words don't match up, he said, James again, you, didn't, you don't pull any eggs in it, you, you, rubbish, rubbish, works and ways and will and word and all, all got to match up, and he says, Abraham, believe the Lord, believe the Lord, he had a few hiccups, absolutely, but he believed the Lord, and this is the epitaph that God wrote over his life. Friend of God. God's friend. What an absolute mighty epitaph. What a mighty epitaph. God's friend. David, the Bible says, served God in his generation. Served the, served the purposes of God in his generation. And what was the epitaph over David's life? A man after my own heart. Wonder. There was a, um, a sort of a, a magazine put out a, 
a quiz, maybe not a quiz, uh, a challenge to, I think it came from something about Ernest Hemingway did, uh, to summarize your life in six words. Summarize your life in six words. And uh, people wrote in, and um, that's a really interesting thing. Summarize your life in six words. And some, not so no great. Some were um, sad. Some were quite, quite uh, instructive and informative. One said, cursed with cancer, blessed with friends. Interesting. This was a funny one. Uh, the psychic said I'd be richer. And someone put in brackets, if you hadn't gone to the psychic, you'd have saved all that money and been richer. Uh, thought I would be more, thought I would have more impact. Yeah. How about Jonah? I like this one. No storm overboard. Whale regurgitated. Yes. <laughs> he said yes a second time, didn't he? Thankfully, the Bible shows us people who've changed. We talked about uh, uh, Nobel, didn't we? And we talked about, um, of course, we have Dickens is Scrooge who changed his legacy. Um, but we also have God's word that is the real that changes. And we have the, the great story of Jacob. That was Jacob's name, the, the heel grabber, the supplanter. A real snake, really, wouldn't he? Um, he, was, uh, he wouldn't trust him. Definitely, you want him on your side. That's definitely, you want him, you want him to be on your side. What a snake, what a, a supplanter. But you know what? When circumstances turned, and that's what God does. We talked this morning earlier about circumstances changing to get our attention. Illness, threat, threat of death, um, persecution, recession. Don't, and we say, Lord, whatever you need to do to save, you do it. If we've got a recession, like we've never seen it before, to get people on their knees before the Lord, then, Lord, that's the way you've got to do it. You've done it in the past. And, you know, eternity is far more important than having a bricks and mortar around you, isn't it? Do you mean? And leaving it behind. And Jacob, on that, that threat of meeting his brother after 20 years, fearful. He was no fighter. Esau was the fighter, and he had 400, and, and the, he had spies out, and 400 men were coming with Esau. Let me tell you, what did he do? He was on his knees. That's the Lord. And, and we have that great story in Genesis 32 in Jabuk. And um, he, he, he gets everyone from him. He, he sends his family, all his flocks and herds, everything. And he's, he's, a, he's a moment solitary before the Lord. And that's the place we've all got to know and find, where you and God have alone time. You and God spend time alone. Why? Because Jesus did it. Mark 1, 36, a, a, a long way before the day was started, Jesus got a, went to a deserted place to be with Father. And in that wrestle with God, overnight, never think you are going to come and say, oh, Lord, da-da. nah, sometimes you've got to battle. Because there's things in his, there was, there was a deep-seated, rooted problem in Jacob. He was a liar and a deceiver. And that needed to be worked out. Needed to be worked out. And when he was wrestling and, and he was he, he saying, God, I need you, I need you. He recognized his need and God said, right, let's deal with the root issue. Jacob, what's your name? What's your name? Because that was the place where he lied, didn't he? That's the place where he'd stolen. Who are you? I'm Esau. What do you mean? You don't sound like Esau. Come near. Oh, you smell like him and you feel a bit like him. Are you sure? I am. I'm Esau. He's a liar. And at that specific point, he had to be dealt with. And when he said, I'm Jacob, I'm Jacob. When there was a change in his nature, there was a change in his name. Now you will be called Israel. Wrestle with God, contended with God, triumphed in God, a prince with God. What a change. What a change. Bless the Lord. Simon, you have, this is what you used to be called. Someone who hears, someone who listens, now you'll be called Peter, the rock, Abraham, Sarah, Hoshea to Joshua. A change in name because there was a change in nature and a change in the legacy. Bless the Lord this morning. Let's change. Maybe a 59th year. Maybe a 59th year. But like 
he said, Lord, I give you my life. You are my life, my all. I surrender my life afresh to you again. I dedicate my whole life to you. A father, um, uh, his son was just about to go to uni and he just wanted to impress on him the most important things in life. Um, uh, he was going to see, and obviously when he got to university, real key there, real danger, especially when he moved away from home. So he thought, I really need to have a, a really moment with my son to really just impress on him the importance of the Lord and, and impro- impo- impress on him the importance of life, really. So they drove to a cemetery. I remember when Hannah was in school, they took him to the uh, cemetery down there for a, a, a school trip. I thought that was interesting, but actually very, very very good, very good. Um, so he took him, and of course his son was a typical teenager, um, Xbox, iPhone, food, hormones, living in a culture that's now, 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 now. But they, he said, I want you to, we're going to walk through this um, cemetery, and I want you to just take your time, and look at every headstone, look at the headstone, and we're going we're gonna to see what we come up with. Just wanted him to realize the urgency, the opportunities that can come and go very quickly. And uh, as they went through, a half hour went by, they sat down. And he said, son, what did you see? He said, well, some of these were really young. He said, some were younger than me. Yeah, he said. What else? Well, some husbands and wives were buried next to each other or with each other, but one died before the other. I wonder if they got lonely. What else? Some of them were, were, died in the 1800s. That was an eternity ago, he said. I wonder what life was like for them. But then he wanted to drill down to his son. He said, did you notice two things, or one thing? On, on, on a headstone, there are two dates, he said. The date where someone was born, and the date where someone passes away. And in between, he said, those two dates, there's a little dash. He said, that dash represents your life on earth. That dash. He said to his son, what will your dash be? What will your dash be? And he said, Dad, what do you think makes a great dash? Ah, what do you think makes a great dash? Great question. What makes a great dash? Well, this world would tell you many things, but the Bible tells you this. I beseech you, brethren, because of the mercies of God, surrender your life. Give your life as living sacrifices to God that will have an eternal impact. Bless us. Let's break bread this morning. Hallelujah.